kindness and mercy, your loving kindness. Thank you again, Father, for bringing us to this appointed hour. I pray right now, Father, that you allow me to decrease and that you would increase. I pray, Father God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, bless the words that have come from my mouth. Let it be a blessing to the people of God. I just pray for you to guide me and direct me and lead me this hour and that you'll receive the glory and that your people will be blessed and we'll give you praise and thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And come on and give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Giving honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Giving honor to each of you in your respectful places. It's a blessing to be back in the house of the Lord. I woke up this morning uh, sort of in that twilight, you know, area where you half sleep and you half wake. And, uh, and I was laying there, and I was thinking about my mother-in-law. I was thinking about my mother-in-law this morning. And uh, she had a favorite song. And, 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 and I found myself in that twilight singing that song, thinking about her. Uh, we don't fully know uh, because she's gone now. But we believe that she knew that there was something much more serious going on in her life that she didn't want everybody to know. And she had a favorite song. And most of you all remember it and know it just another day. And as I began to meditate on that, I began to think how she sung that pretty much every Sunday. If she got up, you could just about to know she was going to sing just another day. And some of you may have gotten tired of it. So, oh, here we go again, just another day. But I began to think and I began to ponder how much that meant to her. Just another day. And sometimes you don't realize that unless you're in a situation with your health or your sickness, you don't realize how blessed you are just to see another day. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thought I'd share that with y'all. Amen. Coming from the book of First Peter today. Amen. First chapter, verses 1 through 11. King James Version, it reads, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partake of the glory that shall be revealed. He said, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready man, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, your opponent, the devil, as a roaring lamb, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If I would give you a thought this morning, it would be caring for the flock. Caring for the flock. Now you might remember Peter. Peter was impulsive. Haughty, hot-headed, and sticking his foot in his mouth a lot. He was larger than life in the early church. 
Everyone had heard the story of Peter walking on the water. Peter saw firsthand Jesus unzip his humanity on the mountain of transfiguration. He saw Jesus perform amazing miracles, turning water into wine, multiplying food. He was there in the courtyard when Jesus faced Pilate, and he witnessed Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. This letter was written by the Apostle Peter about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by then, Peter is obviously a very different person, a more kind, self-controlled, and humble man. Peter wrote two letters to the scattered Christ followers just as persecution was starting to break out. His goal in writing these letters was to encourage their hearts and strengthen their faith in a time of oppression that was to come. Soon Nero would kick the persecution into high gear and Peter would be murdered, crucified upside down at Nero's request, or at Peter's request really, because Peter felt that he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner that Jesus was. And he requested that he be crucified upside down. How about that? But before he gives any directives, Peter starts out by mentioning that he was a witness of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. In verse 1, he says, The elders which are among you, I exhort, uh, to some degree, encourage, who am also an elder. I'm also an elder as well, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. You see, Peter was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he saw Jesus get arrested. He was in the high priest's courtyard and, and had Jesus look at him in sadness after Peter had denied him three times. The suffering of death, the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross left an indelible mark on Peter's heart and soul. Here was God in the flesh dying for the sins of the world. He fought for us and he died for us. But Peter also witnessed Jesus after the resurrection who especially appeared to him. The fact that Peter was an eyewitness has some special credibility. It changed Peter forever. It turned him from an overconfident and reckless young man into a confident and humble follower of Jesus. This also changed him into a bold professor a professor of Jesus. And when I say profess, I don't mean one of college degree, but I mean one that professed about Jesus Christ instead of a scared denier of him. Uh, by this time, Peter has gone on mission trips, raised the dead, healed the sick, and even chased demons out. He had something that he wanted to say to the younger pastors and his fellow pastors to encourage them in their ministry. Again, he says, therefore I strongly urge the elders among you, pastors, spiritual leaders of the church, as a fellow elder and as an eyewitness called to testify of the sufferings of Jesus, as well as one who shares in the glory that is to be revealed. He says, shepherd and guide and protect the flock of God among you because it's all about Jesus. Without the sufferings and the resurrection of Jesus, we would have no reason to have a church or a pastor. Peter told his fellow pastor to do two simple things. He said, shepherd the flock and oversee them. So my mind immediately goes back to Psalm 23 in the picture of the good shepherd leading the sheep through pastures and beside still waters and through the valley of the shadow of death. And his job is to feed the flock and to protect it from danger. You see, back in David's day, shepherding involved a lot more exercise and danger since there were no fences and there seemed to be more wild animals roaming around. So the shepherd had to be bold and he had to be alert in order to take care of the flock 
as they went looking for green grass and water. But Peter, however, isn't talking about literally sheep or cattle. He's talking about human beings with souls. And he's letting us know that eternity is at stake. Before we go any further, think for a minute about the fact that Peter expects there to be overseers in the church. There are some who would prefer just to belong to the church, but they don't want a pastor getting into their business. But Peter insinuates that an integral part of belonging to a church is having a pastor to look out for your soul. Now watch this. If you want to be a member of a church but don't want the pastor to feed you or try to look out for you in the process, then you don't really understand God's design of the church. Pastors are supposed to shepherd and oversee their sheep. That means they will have to know them as a doctor needs to know his patients. Looking over their charts and meeting with them to discuss their ailments. Uh, they're supposed to look out for them and try to warn them of the dangers that they might be in. God has called me to reach out to the person who hasn't been in church for quite some time with encouragement to come back and listen to the word of God. That might also involve a simple phone call or a visit to somebody who is going to have surgery or who has just lost a loved one. That's all part of the call of being a pastor. I've oftentimes told preachers that preaching and pastoring is two different things. Uh, it's easy to, I won't say just easy, but it's easier to just get up and preach and sit down and go home. But to be a pastor is more than just preaching on Sunday morning. See, it takes time and effort to try and make sure all of his members are properly being fed and cared for. Uh, it's good for a pastor to know his flock one-on-one, -on -one, that sometimes he can see something that needs to be addressed, uh, see something that he can help them with. It's not always easy. It's not always fun. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's even dangerous. Think of Peter and Paul and the apostles who were all called to serve God's people and all of them were put to death. You ever thought about it? It would be easy perhaps for a pastor to have a woe is me attitude when he was being attacked by his own people or by the hardened unbelievers in our society. It would be easy for him to say this just isn't worth it. Maybe from a sense of duty, he would feel like he has to do what he has to do because nobody else would do it. Otherwise, he would be quitting on God's people. Maybe he feels like he couldn't do anything else and wouldn't want the disgrace of having to resign. Maybe he thinks to himself, I could work a nine to five job with a lot less stress. Peter warned against this type of mindset. In verse 2 from the NIV Bible, he says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. He said that they should shepherd and oversee because they are willing and eager to serve. So where does eagerness and willing ultimately come from? It comes from faith in Jesus who promised to work all things out for our good. It comes from gratitude to Jesus who died for our sins and rose from the dead to give us forgiveness, hope, and salvation free of charge. It comes from the belief that there is power in the word of God and that the Holy Spirit can work through the ministers preaching and teaching to save souls that Jesus died for. Yeah. Pastors need to go back to the word again and again to feed their own souls so that the Holy Spirit can give them a willing spirit. As David prayed in Psalms 51, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. If you apply this to yourself, 
and how you participate at church, what kind of attitude do you have in coming to worship service and Bible study? Are you here as a sense of duty? Do you complain about it? Do, or do you make any effort to come out? Uh, do you come to church but put no effort into listening or singing? Uh, do you just sit slouched back in your pew and, and just look at your watch waiting for it to end? Or do you dive into the word, ask questions, and eagerly desire to know more about Jesus? Who would you be easier to teach and preach to if you were the pastor? If you've lost your will and desire to listen to Jesus and be with Jesus, you might ask the question, what has gotten in the way? Uh, is it time for you to do a double check on your heart and your soul? Is it time for you to repent and let go of something that has taken your passion and your will away from serving God and the church? He goes on in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, and he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about seeking whom he may devour. He said, whom you need to resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions that are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, you ain't the only one going through you got to learn how to resist the devil. The Bible says draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil and he'll flee. You see, the devil is always looking for ways to deceive and tempt us. But with faith and perseverance, we can resist his attacks. As Christians, we must be alert, awake, and aware of the spiritual battle that surrounds us. The devil seeks to lull us into a spiritual sleep, so to say. But we must resist him and stand firm in the faith. It's no time for going to sleep. When we put on the righteousness of Christ and resist the devil's temptations, we can overcome evil and we can crush it under our feet. You see, it is through our faith and perseverance that we can experience victory over the enemy and live a life that is pleasing unto God. The devil may seek to deceive and weaken us, but ultimately God will triumph over evil. We can take comfort in knowing that. With obedience and faith, we too can overcome the spiritual battles that we face. We must resist his temptations and remain steadfast in our faith, because believe me, you're going to be tempted. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all ways as of man, yet sin not. So we must resist his temptations, and we must remain steadfast in our faith, knowing that we are not alone in our struggles. As believers, it's important to stay alert and aware of the spiritual battles that we face. It's important to stay alert and aware of that we have an adversary uh, that's going about to and fro looking for who he can devour. So by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and relying on his grace and mercy, we can find the strength to persevere and overcome any obstacle. Did you hear me? We can find the strength to persevere, to keep going and overcome any obstacle that he throws in our way. But we got to hold fast to our faith. And trust in the power of God. To see us through every trial. That may come our way. Somebody say. If you're not in a storm. You may be coming out of a storm. And if you're not coming out of a storm. Or not in a storm. Get ready because a storm is coming. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we'll be able to overcome and be in victory. He went on to say, do not hold the evil teachings 
Instead, seek wisdom and guidance from God's word and surround yourself with fellow believers who can encourage you and support you in your faith journey. David had went out to battle with his men, and when they came back, the enemy had came in and burnt the village down and kidnapped or, or took their wives and children away. And the men began to cry and wail. And, and they said, if we had not been out on the battlefield with you, we'd have been here to protect our wife and our children. And they got to the point that they wanted to stone David. But the Bible says David had to encourage himself in the Lord. Every now and then on this journey, you're going to find out that it's hard to find somebody to encourage you. Uh, every now and then, you're going to have to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, that's why the Bible says that man ought always to pray and faint not. Don't quit. Don't give up. Pray without ceasing. Because the effectual, fervent, prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So he said, do not hold on to evil teachings. Instead, seek wisdom and guidance from God's word and surround yourself with fellow believers who can encourage and support you in your faith walk. Well, remember that the enemy will try to deceive and lead us astray, but stay rooted in truth and righteousness. And we can stand firm against his schemes. We got to choose to walk in the light and reject any teachings that go against God's principles. This is the truth he does not want us to know and accept. This is the truth that Satan does not want you to know and accept. Everyone is susceptible to the sneaky operations of the devil when we're not watchful or we're not vigilant. Watch this. If perfect Mama Eve could fall to Satan's sneaky and trickery operations, we need to be on guard. Yeah. Uh, when David slept with his neighbor's wife, Bathsheba, and then plotted to get him murdered to destroy any evidence of his sinful acts. Who do you think was the unseen architect of this despicable act? The devil is a cruel and cunning foe. And to be vigilant against his attacks is not only a duty, but it's also mandatory, essential to our life. Because he come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You see... Deliverance from hell and the certainty of heaven is essential in overcoming the devil. Yes. 